So let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 5. We're looking at the first 16 verses of Matthew chapter 5 today. Our study, God's plan, promises, and power. We read in Matthew 5, verse 1, seeing the multitudes, he, that will be Jesus, went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's a reference to its historical location. And it begins with the reminder that our Lord and Savior Jesus has a heart for the multitudes, a, a message and plan to reach and teach them, a message of forgiveness and cleansing and transformation, and ultimately, as we just sang, perfection in his presence. All through the blood he shed for them. The Sermon on the Mount is good news, but it's not the good news. That's important because there are some who read this sermon and as they did with the law, they thought, well, if I just keep the law, then I'll be fine. Well, not really. You'll still be dead in trespasses and sin, but you will have attempted to do the impossible because no one but Jesus ever kept the entire law. That's not to say we're lawless. It's not to say we're lawbreakers. It's not to say we justify what he would abhor. It's just to say this, that, that the gospel is God's only message of salvation. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The power to save a soul is in that simple gospel message. But God's plan, promises, and powers are spelled out for those who are seeking after him. And it's spelled out for those of us who are in Christ Jesus today. Seeing the multitudes we read, he went up on a mountain when he was seated, his disciples came to him. He begins with disciples. Don't picture just the dozen guys. No, he had hundreds of followers and a disciple is simply one that follows after another desiring to be more like him. There were thousands of people at this particular uh, teaching. It was situated in such a way where he would have been speaking in a, in a theater type setting, Sea of Galilee behind, Capernaum nearby, thousands of people flocking to him because of all the miracles he had been doing and the things they'd heard about him. So he starts here he looks at the multitudes, as I already shared, a message for them, a heart for them, a passion to see them forgiven by him. But he focuses on his disciples and any who were further out could easily draw near. And so he's there with his disciples. And by the way, among these disciples, many will ultimately forsake him. John 6, 6, 6. Couldn't be easier to remember, right, for an address. Many of his disciples went away and walked with him no more. 
It's a horrific time because they'd followed him and listened to him and learned from him. And, and all of a sudden he starts talking about, well, what they're going to need to do. And they're like, we just can't, we're not hanging with this. And, and so many will forsake him. One of the 12 will betray him. Another of the 12 will deny him, not just once or twice, but thrice. Don't get to use that word much, so I had to throw it in. In any case, through these 12 men who had forsaken all at this point to follow him, he would change the world. Not just in that generation, though they had a radical impact on it. But they continue to transform the world because we have their testimony and we have their history. And we see that God took very ordinary men and did extraordinary things through them. That's important to us today because, well, he wants to change our world. And he always does it from the inside out. Religious folk try to conform people outwardly talk this way, look this way, act this way, dress this way. But Jesus changes us from the inside out. So if you're in Christ, he's at work in you. There's a transformation taking place that will ultimately make you more like him. And by the way, that transformation often involves difficult seasons. Well, he opens his mouth and he taught them. Blessed are the poor, verse 3, in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I'm going to do these first eight in pairs, and you'll see why when I get a little further in. The ninth stands on its own, unlike the others. The whole focus changes, and I'll point that out to you when we get there as well. Well, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. They shall be comforted. Unlike the proud, self-righteous, condemning religious leaders of Jesus' day who saw no need for forgiveness, the poor in spirit are humble before him, aware of their sin, desiring his forgiveness and desiring to become more like him. Realizing our absolute poverty of spirit, it's essential, but it leads many to grief and despair. Peter, after affirming that he would never deny his Lord, denies him three times just as the Lord warned him he would. And he went out and wept bitterly. Why? Because he'd failed to do the one thing he promised he would, he would do. Stand with the Lord. Even if I have to die, I'll be with you, he said. But Peter didn't know himself the way Jesus knew him. And Jesus allowed Peter to go through this horrible trial because Peter comes out on the other side a better man. He comes on the other side not only forgiven, but restored, recommissioned and used mightily. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn. Listen, separating these two makes it more difficult to really understand either one. Jesus can't be saying poor people are inherently more spiritual. Um, that's just not the case. But those who recognize their spiritual poverty and desire to walk with and please the Lord who cry out and repent of their sins. He says these will be the heirs of his kingdom and these will be comforted by him. You should know poverty physically and some of you know this experientially. It can be devastating. When Pam and I were first together and first married, we lived on brown rice. I mean, literally. And when we had enough money, we would buy a big bag of it, and that was our breakfast, lunch, and dinner. When we had enough money, we'd buy brown sugar. So we had brown rice with brown sugar for breakfast, plain brown rice for lunch. And then we'd get some soup and put it over the brown rice for dinner. And we did that not for weeks, but for months. And yet, you know, we survived. We actually looked healthier and felt healthier back then, it turns out. 
But, but here's what happens. When, when you take away or separate out the, the, the poverty of spirit and mourning over it, you miss the whole point. He's not saying poor people are more spiritual. We weren't Christians. We weren't spiritual. We did all sorts of things and lived in such a way that had we been Christians at that point, we, well, we would have been the worst witnesses we ever met. But then we came to Christ. And, you know, my good friends, guys I'd played music with for years, they were like, when they found out I became a Christian, they said, well, good for Pam. Because they're like, you're such a jerk. And she's going to just be so much happier. And then I'd be like, well, do you want to give your life to the Lord? And they'd be like, no, we're fine. Ask Pam. You know, and, and, and so the whole thing is they saw me as inferior to them. I wasn't the pick of the litter. I was the last picked. But I was chosen. And I have been transformed. And you guys see the fruit of a life lived for Jesus. And I, I see the same thing in you. It's so important that we get this. While physical poverty can be devastating, spiritual poverty is absolutely devastating unless it causes us to cry out for mercy. And that only happens when we recognize that if, if righteousness were dollars, we're not just broke. We are in debt and it's immeasurable. We could never pay it off. We could never make it right. We could never balance those scales that people try to imagine they're balancing. No, if righteousness were funds, we would be buried in debt. This is how God says it, that we have no righteousness of our own. So righteousness, by the way, just a theological term that means rightness in the sight of God and in the eyes of men. He makes us righteous in Christ Jesus. Then we demonstrate that rightness, that, that, that right thinking and right living and right everything. And the way we talk to people and live before them and, and care for them and reach out to them. The blessing of spiritual poverty is it can lead us to repentance. We cry out for mercy. We stop negotiating with God. Remember when we used to do that? Even as a non-Christian, I used to try to make deals with God. And then I'd find myself in serious trouble. Then I would be praying with everything in me because I grew up going to church as a kid. I just never gave my life to the Lord until I was, well, late 20s. And that was after the birth of my first son, Nathan. God used the birth of him and my responsibility to raise him to say, you want, this kid's going to want to grow up and be like you. Do you like you? Because I'm not real fond. I love you, but I don't like you. Can you understand that? That I feel that way about a lot of people. Why? God says, I have to love you. He never said I had to like you. But, but no one should, should think God just overlooks our sin. No one should... I heard someone talk one day and, and they used a term that was so offensive. They called it easy grace. There's nothing easy about grace except perhaps for the person who receives God's forgiveness through it. The grace, that means the, the gift of God, his son and everything that follows, believing in him, belonging to him. It's all a gift to us. But Jesus paid dearly so we could have the free gift of everlasting life. So important that we process that. Well, not negotiating with God, not making promises to God as many of us were guilty of and some still. Oh Lord, if you just get me through this, I promise you. Listen, there's only one promise keeper who always keeps his promises and that's Jesus I'm not saying well you shouldn't intend to do good or or strive to do good or rely on God to give you the ability to do good but when you promise to do good you're setting yourself up for a fall because we just don't have it within us to be who only he 
can cause us to become. Well, those first two, poor in spirit and mourning, the first to promise the kingdom of heaven, the second they shall be comforted. The next blessed verse five are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know the powerful politically, those connected to them, those who rule and reign in tyranny, they are everywhere. Not just in the world out there, but in our own society today. But every one of them will ultimately fail. Well, the humble, grieving, broken, helpless, meek, and gentle, caring, and concerned for others will inherit the earth. The Greek word translated meek here is pros. It's an interesting word because the Greeks used it of a horse that was broken. And it's actually not a bad picture, but Jesus provides us with a much better one. Because the word, well, meek can be and elsewhere is translated gentle or even humble. And if you know anything about horses, well, someone can break a horse, but they can do it with hostility and, and with, well, you know, just, well, giving it, giving it to them and, and all of that. Or you can gentle a horse. I can't do either. I've had experience with horses. I wasn't a horse person. Some of you will know. I, I went down with Pam to Mexico once and we rented horses on the beach because it was the beach. And I ended up on a defective horse. It just wouldn't go. And I'm like, honey, my horse is broken. And she's like, okay, she's had horses. She grew up around all that. So we switch horses and guess what? When I got on that horse, it broke. And that's because I had no clue what I was doing. And, and even a horse knows when a donkey's on him. <laughs> so what I'm saying in this is, is there's a way to break a horse, but there's a better way, and that's to gentle a horse. What's the difference? A truly gentled horse is safe to be near. It's, it could be ridden even without a bit or a bridle or, or, or a saddle. And if you're like, no, that can't happen. Well, you just need to watch Heartland and you'll understand the whole thing. God doesn't have to break us, by the way. We come pre-broken. And uh, it's like that Christmas present that you ordered. You got it early. You were going to rewrap it to make sure the kids loved it. And, and you open it and all the pieces are broken. That's what God got when he got us just a broken person, but he didn't break us. He gentles us and he doesn't use intimidation or domination or manipulation. He whispers the truth in our ears and our hearts break. The truth about him, the truth about us, the thing that's keeping us, the truth about what keeps us from him and from his will for our lives. So we come to him and he gives us a new heart. We came broken. We come broken. But he is not just doing a repair on us. He's giving us a new heart and, and transforming us by the renewing of our minds. He's making us into the people that only he can see because he sees the finished product. He sees the outcome. Well, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The meek will inherit the earth. You tell that to leaders today and they'll be like, yeah, right. But when Jesus says it, you can count on it. It's absolutely assured. It won't be the strong. It won't be the mighty. It won't be the one who rules in tyranny. No, it will be the meek, the humble, the gentle that inherits the earth. The, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, again, rightness in the sight of God will be filled. 
Listen to Jesus' words related to this very thing. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, for you note takers. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. So note thus far, the poor in spirit mourn over their condition. The humbled are hungry and thirsting for righteousness and, and rest. And they find both at the feet of Jesus. Well, next up, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. There in verse seven. And then it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. To be merciful means to be filled with compassion and empathy for others. Many came to Jesus pleading for mercy, some for themselves, others for their children. The rich man pled that God would send Lazarus back to his brothers. He was in Hades, you see, and, and, and he prayed, send him back to my brothers because if they see one rise from the dead, then they'll believe. Here's an irony. Another guy who just happens to be named Lazarus rises from the dead at Jesus' command. But do the people believe? No, those who set their heart on Jesus' destruction, those who set their heart on, on ending him, they also said, we're going to have to deal now with Lazarus. You can't have a guy sitting around who used to be dead and now he's alive and he became a tourist attraction in Bethany, which, by the way, was on the way to Jerusalem. So, so, so the picture here for us, and it's an important one, is that Jesus is filled with compassion and filled with empathy for others. The Romans, they saw no virtue in mercy. They didn't even have a concept of it, nor did their culture value purity. So Jesus' words sounded strange to many, foolish to others. We live in a culture very much like theirs. It has changed so much in the last 20 years or 40 years or 60 years. But, but, but the point is, what we knew, those of you who are older, what we knew America to be and what we understood God's will to be, our society is so anti all those things. And we are truly living in the days prophesied by Isaiah when he said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light. That's happening all around us. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're not watching the news or you're not on Facebook or you're not on uh, Instagram. And by the way, I'm not doing any of those things because I don't need to be further tainted by, by the insane things that people are thinking. My heart needs to be soft toward them. They're not our enemies. They're people trapped in sin who need the forgiveness we found in Jesus. Well, he continues, and I will as well. Blessed are the peacemakers, verse 9, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Just as Jesus came to reveal the Father, and he is the exact representation of the Father, he, he, to see him is to, well, to know the Father. He's not the Father. He was sent by the Father who approved him. This is my beloved Son, whom I will, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. That's on the Mount of Transfiguration. Earlier on, it is baptism by the Apostle John. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus came to reconcile people lost 
dead in trespasses and sin sinners to the father. He came as the ultimate peacemaker. And when we see him, he could say, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. Some want that to mean that, well, they're just the, there's just, there's only one at a time. Someone actually came up with this crazy idea that there was the father who became the son, who then became the Holy Spirit. At the baptism, Jesus was baptized. The father speaks from heaven. The spirit descends in the form of a dove and remains upon him. So John the Baptist would know this Jesus is the savior, the promised one, because the father had already revealed that to him. Well, if we're going to rightly represent the Prince of Peace, we need to become peacemakers. And if you get frustrated, if you get angry at the things you hear and see people saying and doing, there is such a thing as righteous indignation. Jesus cleansed the temple. Don't make my father's house, this place of prayer and praise, a house of merchandise. But listen, very little of my anger over the years has been righteous indignation. It's just common frustration. And Jesus had to show me that, that I should never confuse the two. I should never excuse my words or my actions if they misrepresent him. Because I need to be a peacemaker if I'm going to represent the one who came to make peace between sinners and the father who sent him. Well, in any case, no greater honor than to be called the children of God. He says the sons of God, but it applies to all the children of God. Now you are children of God, we'll read later. And it doesn't appear what, what exactly what that's all going to be. But, but we know when we're with him, we'll be like him and we'll see him as he is. Well, this particular passage surprises some because we would think that peacemakers would be applauded, maybe get a Nobel Peace Prize. You know, you can get that for being on TV. You can get that for being an athlete and, and raising some money for poor children somewhere. You can be awarded by men for things that they just bring glory to you. That's not to say helping people is something we shouldn't be. No, we should be doing everything we can for our fellow man. But to think that, that somehow we deserve to be highly thought of or valued or appreciated or rewarded. Listen, let me clue you in. That's not going to happen to you. Not in this culture, not if you're like Jesus, because peacemakers like John the Baptist he was that. He was trying to bridge the gap between his own people and the God they had forsaken. And he was calling them to repent, his own people, God's chosen people to repent. Why? Because God said they were guilty and separated from him by their sin. And they were saying, but we're the children of God. We're the chosen ones. And John's saying, no, you need to repent. And when they ask, well, what would that look like for us? To the soldiers, he said, well, just don't oppress people. Don't abuse people. Don't, don't take advantage of people and be satisfied with your wages. You can go back and look at John's ministry. I highly recommend you do. He called men to bear fruit worthy of repentance. Demonstrate that there's real repentance. That you're not just thinking a little different or willing to make a slight adjustment. That you realize that only Jesus can make you the person he intends you to become. Those persecuted for righteousness sake are heirs of God. Well, that's the four pairs. And then we get to the, the ninth and final beatitude. And it, and it really does break the pattern because up to this point he's been saying those or them or they but now all of a sudden he says blessed are you 
That means he's gone from talking about those people out there, whoever they might be. And now he's zoning in to and, and focusing in on the people before him. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Those last four words are so essential in that particular beatitude. Because if people are slamming you, but what they're saying's true, you might not like it, but you deserve it. But when you do good and me, they speak evil of you, when, when, when you're, you're a blessing to them, but they revile and persecute you, he says, make sure it's falsely for his sake, elsewhere, the gospel's sake, elsewhere, his name's sake. And then he says, and we saw this last week, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Listen, he's not saying, oh boy, persecution. Oh good, they're slandering me again. Only a fool would do that or say that or even think that. But he is saying when it happens to you and it's for the gospel's sake or his name's sake or his sake, you can rejoice knowing all things are working together for good. God will use that in your life. And when you don't return evil for evil, when you don't return in kind, they're going to wonder what is going on with you. Man, I've been harsh up to you and lied about you. I did all these things and... You're still kind to me. Why would that ever be? That's the open door to share that you would have been just like them. But Jesus has changed your life. That Jesus has changed your heart. That Jesus has, well, made you a new person in him. Great is your reward in heaven. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad. For so they persecuted the prophets before you. I, I, I title this God's plan and some are thinking, wait a minute, are you saying God's plan is that I be persecuted and slandered and, and, and abused? And the answer is no. I'm not saying that and this isn't saying that. God's plan is that you would be aware that these things are going to happen. So when they do and the enemy whispers in your ear, you deserve that, you know. He's mad at you. You don't think God's going to keep loving and caring for you after you did that. You knew better this time. Listen, if you don't know to expect these things, you're going to think something went wrong when they happen. So if you are aware all these things and more may and probably will happen to you, if you give your life to and live your life for Jesus, you won't be shocked, caught off guard, unprepared as many are today. I have a friend, Danny Lehman, and I uh, first met him in Las Vegas when Pam and I were visiting there. I went to see a dear friend of mine, John Michaels, who I'd gone to Israel with, and he wasn't there. And I was so bummed. I was like, I can't believe it. He's not here, Pam. And we were visiting her family who were all in Vegas at that point. But long story short, Danny gets up there and I'm looking and I'm going, another surfer, you know, and, and, and that's what he was. And a beach guy, totally. But he, again, he begins to teach and he begins to preach. And, and my heart just was so knit together with his. I went up after and said, I was so disappointed to see it was you. And he goes, you don't even know me. I said, no, I got over it. But then I began to tell him how God had worked in my heart in that message and through that message. And we became dear friends. And he's traveled many times to California. He had a mother-in-law here. And, and for years and years, he'd come. And I'd be like, he was the only one besides Gail Irwin, who I ever said, if you're nearby, you give me a call. I want you to come and share with our people. We have some great books that he's written, Bring Them Back Alive and Before You Hit the Wall and all sorts of others. But, but a passionate evangelist who, who never stood before thousands as some have and preached, but he has led thousands to the Lord. You know how he does it? 
one at a time, one-on-one, -on, -one, on an airplane or in a restaurant or wherever he is, Jesus is the subject matter and he has a way to get you there. And I just want to say that, that well, that, that, that Danny has experienced what I've experienced, what you experience, people who used to love you, not so fond of you. Because if you put Jesus first and, and they're living in sin and you're like, you know what? I love you, but what you're doing is self-destructive. What you're doing is damaging to you and all your relationships. So many people so don't want to hear it. So in any case, he shared a couple things. I think I have time for them. Let me see. Anybody got appointment? There's nowhere to go. Everything's closed. It's COVID. And so um, he, he shared, because he's all about evangelism, that, that it's a dangerous thing to use Santa Claus evangelism. That was his term. I like it. Because there are people who are teaching and preaching that if you'll just come to Jesus, he's got this big old bag of stuff and he's just going to unload on you all these blessings. And while it's true, he's going to bless and does. All sorts of hard things can happen in the midst of walking with Jesus and representing Jesus. You find people who used to like you no longer do. And you find that, that doors that used to be open to you, well, they're shut now. And so the idea, you come to him and you get all the goodies and none of the problems. And that's absolutely contrary to what Jesus is teaching here. Are we blessed because we're in Christ Jesus? Of course. But to think that the world is going to embrace us and love us because of it, that's really foreign to reality. There's also Frankenstein evangelism. So, so and, and you might be able to already figure this one out. The, the Santa Claus evangelism just says, come to Jesus and everything's going to be great. No worries, no problems, no bills, no debts. Just a rosy life walking with Jesus. I found that not to be accurate. But Frankenstein evangelism is literally trying to scare the hell out of people. It's saying, he's going to get you unless you come to Jesus. And that's not true either. You do have a free will. You get to make a choice. But anyone who says, well, I'm not really going to make a choice. Well, then you have. Because if you don't choose Jesus, then you've chosen to stay dead in trespasses and sin. To live your life apart from him and his will for your life. So here's how Jesus deals with both those issues. He says in John 15, 18, and I want you to know where it is so you can look at it later. If the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, then the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. I like that. We're in the world, but not of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our rewards for a life well lived awaits us in heaven. All the blessings we have are in Christ Jesus, but most are reserved for us in heavenly places. And if you think, well, what about all the stuff I wanted now and was promised? They ripped you off. They lied to you. You're going to get some stuff. But think about this. Life here on planet Earth is short. If you're young, you're thinking, well, I don't know about that. If you're older, you know it's true. But eternal life, everlasting life in his presence, that's to infinity and beyond. It just never ends. So think about if you had to choose, well, I want everything this life has to, to offer, or I'll take everything the everlasting life has to offer. Only a fool would trade eternal blessings for temporal ones. And you're no fool. At least I hope you're no fool. Jesus just said, if the world hates you, you're in good company. They hated me first. Remember the word I said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. But all these things they'll do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Peter will later write, in 1 Peter 4, 19, 
And he learned this one the hard way, but he learned it. Let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him and doing good as to a faithful creator. Well, each of the nine Beatitudes begins with the word blessed. It speaks not just of blessings, but of a state, a status, an abiding experience of walking with and living for Jesus. Each ends with the promise only God can fulfill. So all our hope is in him, in his word, in his promises, and his faithfulness. So before we close, just a couple things. In everything, give thanks. We saw it last time. For everything, give thanks. We talked about it. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Today it's rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. Note there be attitudes, not do attitudes. Why? Because you need to be who God intends you to become before you can do what God wants to accomplish through you. Oh, he'll work through you now. We see that with Peter and the guys. They were far from complete. They were far from a finished product, but they were available to him and used by him. But he gives us at the close of this particular study a revelation and an exhortation straight from his heart. Take a look at it. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Salt was and is still today used in many places as a preservative. It was also used as currency, like toilet paper today. That's where the phrase, that's where the phrase, he's not worth his salt comes from. They would pay Roman soldiers with salt because it was easy to transport and believe it or not, very valuable in that day. So you'd have your salt and then you could trade that for goods. Thanksgiving's coming for them, Passover. But they were Romans, so forget where that was going. Uh, if you were a Christian, though, and you were, you know, in this situation, you want to make sure, if you are a Christian in this situation, you want to make sure you're worth your salt. That, that, that you have a preserving influence on those who know you best. Unlike Lot, who couldn't get anyone but his wife and daughters to leave Sodom and Gomorrah before its destruction, though he spoke to many and said, hey, come with me, judgment's coming, this place is going to be burnt to the ground. They laughed at him and thought he was mocking. That might happen to you, but you want to make sure there are people around you who actually believe you. They believe you when you tell them you're a Christian. They believe you when you say Jesus died so they could be forgiven sin. They believe you when you say judgment is coming and this whole thing's going to burn. Well, salt of the earth. And then he says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Light's primary purpose is illumination. And we know Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Those who follow after me will not walk in darkness. His word, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It shows me if I'm standing on solid ground. And as I'm moving ahead, am I walking a road and a path that's safe and right? Or am I heading into trouble? So important that we get it. Light illuminates, and that's what we're to do. We're not to shine in such a way, and I know you've had this experience. It's night. You're going to do fireworks. You're going to do something. It's that time of year. You're out, and somebody has their flashlight. And you're like, hey, I could use a little light over here. And they shine it right in your eyes. 
not helpful. And, and so to say it, this is simply to say, we need to shine for him. I hear people shouting at the darkness and about the darkness and I see other people just flipping the switch. The light comes on and the darkness flees because the two cannot exist in the same space. You are the salt of the world. You are the light of the world. So Lord, I thank you for your words of encouragement to us today. Thank you that the things we experience, you've already laid them out for us. You've told us what we can expect from you and what we can expect to the world and from the world if we're faithful to you and living for you and even rightly representing you. Lord, enable us by your spirit to be all the things you've called us to be poor in spirit, mourning over our absolute debt because of our sin, meek and hungering and thirst for righteousness, merciful and, well, persecuted for righteousness sake, reviled, persecuted and spoken evil of. Lord, enable us to bless those who've cursed us and to do good to those who've, who've abused us and to do, demonstrate you, Lord, in all our conversations and in all our interactions. Lord, it's a desperate time on planet Earth, not just because of the pandemic, but because of all the things you said will happen in the last days. And we see those dominoes lining up and we know soon that first one will flip and they're going to fly, Lord. I just pray that not one here would be lost to you, that not one logged on or listening in would be lost to you, that all would come to repentance. We know it's not your will any perish, but all come to repentance. So make that real in every heart where someone's wondering or struggling or trying to put it together. And Lord, for my brothers and sisters, just pour your spirit out on us. So as we walk with you and live for you and represent you, we'll do so in a way that brings glory to you. Our light so shining before men that they see our good works, but the Father, our Father in heaven, gets all the glory. If you're here or you're listening or in or logged on and you've never said, Jesus, I get it. I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. I've heard you died for sin. You were buried and rose again. I believe all that. But Lord, in my heart of hearts, I know I've never really given my life to you. And I'm certainly not living my life for you. So if that would be you today, I'm going to pray a short prayer. And believers, feel free to pray along. But any of you in the valley of decision, needing to decide now, for Jesus. Know this, he's for you. And he demonstrated his love to you when he died for your sins, was buried and rose again. So pray aloud after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for drawing me today, for speaking to me, for your patience with me and kindness to me. Thank you for opening my eyes, for softening my heart, for opening my ears and telling me what's true. I confess I'm guilty in your sight, a sinner in need of a savior. And I confess Jesus as my Lord and my savior in this moment, here and now, and forevermore. In his precious name I pray, amen. Let's welcome any and all into the family. We don't know who you are, you know. Listen, if you're here, 
and you just prayed to receive that prayer, to receive the Lord, you prayed that prayer for the very first time, please come forward. We want to connect with you, welcome you to the family of God, give you a Bible. If you're checking us out online or following us uh, in any other medium, make sure you get in touch with us so we can get someone to you who will do the very same thing. Welcome you to the family of God. And in the midst of that, um, get you a Bible so you can get started in your study of the Word of God. Blessed to be with all of you. Thankful for another beautiful day. Praying that this continues. And I see more of you each week, and I'm loving that too. Invite people. Tell them we're safe out here. There's plenty of social distancing. And more than that, there's worship and teaching and, well, a chance to connect with the true and living God. Let's all stand for one last song.